Hello, I'm Jonas Shrevinsky. Welcome on board the Eastern Express. And as always, I hope you enjoy the journey. Now, on this episode, we're looking into a story from the Far East. Xi Jinping's bold declaration to President Biden that China will annex Taiwan. Yes, Xi Jinping has made it clear that the island democracy is on the bucket list, and he is not even shy about it. The Taiwan-China saga is far from over, and the next episode promises to be as unpredictable as ever. And with the US standing by, it is bound to be an interesting story. So without further ado, let's take a look at our latest report to find out more. At the beginning of the week, Taiwan hosted a China-focused summit, sparking strong opposition in Beijing. According to the event's organizers, Chinese authorities did everything in their power to stop some of the foreign guests from attending. At least eight politicians, including those from Slovakia, North Macedonia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bolivia and Colombia, were contacted by various means. One was asked to travel to China instead. Beijing routinely discourages foreign officials from visiting Taiwan, which China claims as its own territory. This year's summit of the Interparliamentary Alliance on China was attended not only by 49 lawmakers from 23 countries and the European Parliament, but also by Taiwan's president, Lai ching te The official praised all the attendees for coming, saying their presence demonstrated the importance and support that various countries have for Taiwan. He also emphasized that the event sends a strong message to democratic partners around the world that democracy requires unity and protection. China considers Lai a dangerous separatist due to his stance on defending Taiwan's sovereignty and autonomy. Three days after his swearing-in, the Chinese army launched military exercises surrounding the island with jets and vessels. This was in revenge for Lai's inauguration speech, which Beijing considered a confession of Taiwan independence. In recent years, China has stepped up its military and political pressure on democratic Taiwan. While Taiwan officially has only a dozen diplomatic allies, it has improved its partnerships with democracies around the world, especially the United States, currently its largest weapons provider, while Beijing further spreads the rhetoric of unification being inevitable. And now, as always, let's take a look at the issue in greater detail. Back in February, Xi Jinping reportedly told Biden during the G20 summit that China plans to annex Taiwan. He allegedly assured Biden that this unification would be peaceful. Now, call me skeptical, but when an authoritarian leader promises peace while eyeing a democratic neighbor, it's like a cat promising not to eat the goldfish. Not very reassuring at all. Xi Jinping's statement came hot on the heels of Taiwan's recent presidential election, where Lai ching te a pro-independence candidate from the Democratic Progressive Party, took the win. This victory is a big win for those who value democracy and self-determination, but it is a thorn in the side of the Chinese Communist Party. Beijing views Taiwan as a rogue province, and the idea of an independent Taiwan is as appealing to them as a fly in the soup. Now, Let's add some historical flavor, shall we? Xi Jinping's rhetoric mirrors that of another power-hungry leader. Yes, you've guessed it, Vladimir Putin. Remember how Russia talked about Ukraine before their infamous invasion? The same dismissive language about a neighbor sovereign state. And look where that got us. A prolonged conflict with global instability following. The similarities are chilling and should serve as a wake-up call. What's more, China isn't just making noise, they have been ramping up military exercises around Taiwan and applying diplomatic and economic pressure to isolate the island. It's like a schoolyard bully tightening his grip on lunch money negotiations. And the implications of these actions are serious, very serious indeed. Experts warn of a potential hybrid war involving cyber attacks, economic sanctions and military provocations. The United States, traditionally Taiwan's big brother, has a crucial role to play here. Back in 2022, Biden promised to defend Taiwan if China attacked. But with the 2024 US elections just around the corner, there is a question mark hanging over this commitment. If Donald Trump wins, will he maintain the same stance or will his unpredictable policies throw Taiwan under the bus? Let's also talk about strategic ambiguity here. The US policy 
being deliberately vague about how it feels about Taiwan's independence, this strategy is meant to deter both sides from making any rash moves. However, recent US actions like Biden's defense promise and Nancy Pelosi's controversial visit to Taiwan have nudged this ambiguity towards a more confrontational stance. The future of Taiwan hangs in a precarious balance. Will China risk global economic backlash and potential military conflict to fulfill its unification dream? Will the US stand firm or waver its support? Only time will tell, but one thing is certain. The world is watching with bated breath. And now here to shed more light on the issue is Marcin Grabowski, Director of the Center for International Studies and Development at the Aguilonian University. Hello and welcome to TVP World. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you again. So several reports have appeared, including by The Economist, suggesting that China might be stockpiling materials and resources for an unspecified purpose. And of course, there are suggestions that one of these purposes could be confrontation with the West in the wake of a possible invasion of Taiwan. How likely do you think that this is going to happen? Of course, that I could take it into account, however, my approach would be. Uh, it's a simple uh, problem with Chinese economy. Um, if you look at um, the typical um, typical indicators for coming economic crisis, then uh, stock or rising stock uh, is usually one of them, and this could uh, have been observed during uh, during a global financial crisis uh, more than ten years ago. Uh, that uh, was simply by um, the uh, manufacturing global uh, value added chain uh, ending in China with r relatively um, small or with shrinking demand on what uh, what China was was producing so I would first start with this explanation then if we think about possible confrontation with the US and I pres uh, presume that's the essence of your question whether we could expect there will be uh, constant uh, confrontation and how uh, we can naturally imagine uh, that China is using its predominantly missiles uh, crafts to uh, to strike on, on Taiwan. However, we have to remember that um, most analysis uh, say uh, China wouldn't be able to capture Taiwan. It is, however, possible to seriously um, Dematch or even destroy Taiwan with uh, crafts uh, with missiles. Um, however, capturing it is is basically impossible. And Chinese should realize it, having um, um, had observed what's happening in the Ukraine. Ukraine is, in strategic point of view, a military point of view, an easy country to capture. Russia. Uh, was technically second largest uh, or second strongest, sorry, that's a better expression, military in the world. Like if we look at the global firepower index, um, and of course it wasn't able to 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 capture um, to capture Kiev or Ukraine or large parts of the Ukraine. Having so technically, to technically the largest army in the world, I'm glad that you mentioned this and emphasized technically. So on the other hand, you have the Chinese military growing very fast, uh, technologically perhaps superior in some respects to the Russians because they have technologies on their own and yet untested in the field. Um, so why would some of the US military commanders uh, suggest even that there might be a specific date by which the Chinese military could be ready to attack Taiwan? 2027 was the most recent estimate. Are they simply saying this to indicate they might be technically ready to attack? That, that doesn't mean that they will attack. And also, what would you say would be the best option for deterrence here? Even if China is ready to do that, they might still decide Perhaps this is not the best way to go about it. Uh, trying to answer all those all those questions first. Uh, yes, Chinese military is is as large as like 2.3, 2.4 million uh, million troops. Um, however, again, mostly this this military um, may have similar problems um, to Russian military. 
So it is centralized system. You report to your commander what your commander wants to hear. Uh, and the real assessment of Chinese military may be difficult, especially at the modern uh, warfare. We don't know it last time China participated in a full-scale warfare uh, international conflict was 1979, the one with Vietnam, and it proved that Chinese military um, was in bad, bad condition. Of course, since then, modernization of Chinese military was one of top priorities of uh, the PRC. But um, for decades but, uh, without actual deployment, the right? Four decades of not doing any real combat. I mean, even the Russians, I mean, they had a, a, a basically an ongoing uh, tour of duty, so to say, from their perspective, at least. They fought in Chechnya. They were, uh, you know, obviously used for pacifying some internal struggles. And then came Georgia. Then came the first part of the war in Ukraine. China wasn't really doing anything like this. That's why we don't know whether it's ready to fight. And we presume it is not. Um, I understand the uh, warnings given by by the U.S. Uh, commanders that it could be 2027. Um, my opinion is, even though China um, could technically try uh, in 2027, um, I can't imagine it unless there is one situation, extreme crisis in the PRC to achieve the so-called align along the flag effect, so to unify Chinese people um, with or along the uh, CCP, Chinese Communist Party, and personally Xi Jinping, could basically um, result in an attempt to capture Taiwan. Yeah, because of the serious crisis, no other solution visible. Um, the costs of such an operation uh, would be immense. As I said, it's unlikely China could capture Taiwan, even though it could start the conflict. If the U.S. is not reacting, that could even uh, bring some limited success to the PRC. Otherwise, U.S. technical superiority over Chinese military is extreme. We have to remember that China is spending... 220, 280 billion dollars a year for its military. That's a lot, but it's only 30, 35 percent of American expenditure. So the gap between U.S. and China is surprisingly rising rather than shrinking, and this is a big issue. Of course, Taiwan, Taiwanese military had been weakened during Ma Zhou presidency. However, recent. Um, um, recent years is gradual rebuild of Taiwanese military capabilities with support, with cooperation of the U.S. under Trump and under Biden. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see so. Then, getting back into our, let's say, political fic, uh, fiction or um, uh, scenario of the attack, I, I still perceive it as as such. Um, the costs for China as estimated by Rand Corporation a couple of years ago, um, in case of full-scale conflict with the US, so we presume the US is engaging in the conflict, would be 25 to 35% of its GDP. Um, survival of Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping personally in such situation would be very unlikely. So that's an excellent point huge. there. Right? I mean, this is an excellent point because uh, you clearly see that it would be a huge gamble for China. And yet, many people thought the same about Russia. And then Russia decided to go on a totally irrational, from our point of view, military adventure in Ukraine. It wanted to capture Kiev within days. Years have passed, more than two years. Uh, they are still fighting the war, no peace on the horizon. Uh, that brings me to another issue. We are assuming the US would become involved, but will they? We often talk a lot about how Trump could change US policies vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. Could the same happen with respect to Taiwan, or could a Trump presidency embolden China to strike, or at least to use some sort of hybrid warfare tactic in order to try and subjugate the island? That's a very difficult question. And uh, of course, we presume the US could possibly engage. Uh, however, the resistance 
uh, in the US would be huge. Um, having in mind that uh, it is a serious, uh, a serious opponent. Um, I would start with the Russian perception. Russian perception was as such. Um, this, Ukraine is an easy target and no one is interested in defending Ukraine. Um, let's see what happens uh, first with Georgia. Yeah, no one reacted. Then we have Crimean Peninsula and Donbass, basically no cost, no cost in terms of international um, the behavior, international performance of Russia, extremely limited sanctions. Let's try. Our military is strong, as I said, that's a problem with uh, centralized um, authoritarian systems or totalitarian systems. Um, you get the reports from your military that everything works extremely well and the next levels of um, command accepts it and gives even better reports to their commanders. So there, there could be perception Kiev is within range of Russian military, and technically we were on the verge. We have to remember it. Um, secondly, uh, no, no international calls uh, coming. Um, at, uh, in, in the case of China, we have two or three differences. So the most important difference is China knows that the US reacted even though U.S. technically was not an ally of uh, of Ukraine. It, of course, it was co-guarantor of its uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty, as you remember, together with the U.S. and, and, and Russia, paradoxically. Uh, but uh, technically, it was not an ally. Um, the guarantees given to Taiwan from the side of the United States are stronger. The U.S. would be reluctant to start a full-scale war with China. But would China be really open to take this risk, seeing what's happening with Russian invasion in the Ukraine? I seriously doubt. I presume that it wouldn't because of what happened in the uh, in the in the Russo-Ukrainian Russo war. Yeah, the military that uh, is, according to some sources stronger than Chinese military, even though smaller, um, had huge problems in capturing Ukraine, having very easy land access. With Taiwan Strait and Chinese naval weakness, I can't imagine it is a risk worth taking unless this situation, whether the US would react, yes, it would, avoiding full-scale conflict. So we would have a similar situation, gradual escalation, gradual uh, rising rising support. So if, if Taiwan is able to keep its position for some time, then the US would gradually support it more and more. And speaking and of, of which, Speaking of escalation, unfortunately, we cannot escalate any further because we have run out of time. Still, it is a fascinating discussion and hopefully we'll be able to return to it. And also, hopefully, on a purely theoretical basis. So no reports of ships moving across the Taiwan Strait to capture the island anytime soon. Martin Grabowski was our guest today here on TVP World. Thank you very much for joining us and for sharing your expertise. Thank you for um, hosting me today. Bye bye. And now we're moving on to Eastern News Flash, a series of all the other stories from the East that you really don't want to miss. Russian authorities are rumored to be preparing to release between 20 and 30 political prisoners and journalists as part of an imminent prisoner exchange with the United States and Germany. If completed, it would mark the largest coordinated swap since the end of the Cold War. Reports concerning the planning of a significant prisoner exchange have intensified after several dissidents and journalists jailed in Russia have been moved from their regular prison cells to undisclosed locations. The list of individuals prepared for the exchange includes those associated with the late Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny, such as Vladimir Karamurza, Russian citizens convicted of criticizing the war in Ukraine, and US citizens, most notably American journalist Ivan Gershkovich. 
Russia last exchanged prisoners with the US in December 2022, when it released American basketball star Brittany Griner for the notorious arms dealer Victor Boot, who had been held in a US prison for 12 years. Should it happen, the upcoming swap would be the largest since 2010, when Washington and Moscow exchanged 10 Russian secret agents who had been living undercover in the US for four Russian citizens. The lower chamber of the Russian parliament, the State Duma, has approved a draft law requiring naturalized Russian citizens to participate in military registration. Naturalized citizens who refuse will be stripped of their Russian passports. Police raids on Central Asian migrant workers have intensified across Russia. In some cases, detained laborers have been forcibly transported to military recruitment centers, where they have been forced to sign contracts to be sent to the Ukrainian front. In an attempt to ease the shortage of troops, Vladimir Putin signed a decree raising the one-time payments for those who sign up to take part in the invasion of Ukraine from 2,260 US dollars to 4,600 and 40 US dollars. Meanwhile, some Russian regions and cities are independently offering their own payments for people going to war in Ukraine. Municipal authorities in Moscow are currently offering a 22,000 US dollar signing bonus for one-year military contracts. Putin's September 2022 mobilization decree sparked protests and a mass exodus of Russian men to other countries. Russia has completed the withdrawal of its border guards from Yerevan's Zvartnots International Airport. The move was demanded by Armenia earlier this year amid rising tensions between the two countries. Russian border guards have been stationed in Zvartnots for decades, as well as along Armenia's borders with Turkey and Iran, mainly to showcase the close military ties between Russia and Armenia. However, Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan announced in March that his government had given Moscow until August 1st to remove the border guards from the airport. Pashinyan says Armenia is able to carry out border checks without Russian assistance. The Russian foreign ministry criticized the decision, calling it a threat to Armenia's security and economic development and claiming Yerevan risks causing irreversible damage to Russian-Armenian relations. The Russian deployment ended with an official farewell ceremony at Zvartnots airport, during which the newly appointed commander of the Armenian border guards thanked the Russian troops for their service. And for this episode of Eastern Express, it's the end of the line. Please stay with us here on TVP World for more latest news and updates. I'm Jonas Rewinski. Bye for now.